All right, let's uh, Galatians chapter number five. I'm going to just coast through a lot of this chapter and probably read a good bit of it today. One of my favorite books of the Bible because of the transition context that's taking place and the figuring out and the almost lostness a little bit with the people of God and new believers and established believers and uh, uh, an apostle who's trying to figure out how to navigate that and help people uh, transition through certain uh, ways of thinking into new ways of thinking. And it's one of my favorite books of the Bible because it takes a lot of what we think we know and it just, it just jogs it all up, right? I was telling some of our team this morning, I think, uh, just to recap a little bit of last week, one of the, I think one of the things the enemy does is that he, he doesn't always use the obvious. He doesn't always just pick like the secular rated R material to mess with you. In, in fact, the Bible says there's a way that seems right, but it leads to death. If, if the enemy's um, one thing, he is pretty clever. I'll give him that part, right? Even though he's an idiot, he's kind of smart, right? You ever meet a smart idiot? It's, it's, it's kind of a, a contradiction, but they, they exist. I'm one of them. <laughs> and the enemy, more than we realize, doesn't use the rated R stuff as, as much as uh, we probably think. It's usually things that are associated with God or kind of like God that he uses to really mess with us. And you see this throughout the scripture, and we see it very at the very beginning of Genesis, that he takes something that God had made and had a commandment revolving around, and he takes the fruit, he takes something that even came from the creation of God, and he twists its, their understanding of it just enough to make them want something that they all of a sudden perceive they don't have. I was thinking this morning in the world of Instagram and uh, getting our dopamine fixed by a couple clicks on a like button and all that world that we live in. It's so like the enemy to start to have conversations that immediately make you feel like you're missing some fullness of life, right? And this shows up in our faith all the time because Jesus paid it all. He came and died for our sin. He gave us this life of the spirit that is living inside you. The Bible says the same spirit that raised him from the dead is inside of you, right? But because of life experience and things that we go through and disappointments and the times that it didn't work out, work out we allow that to somehow trump this life of the spirit that is inside of us. And the enemy, I think, uses that. And sometimes it's not even the enemy. Sometimes it's us. And we get into these places where it seems like we forget the full life of God is literally right here, right? And then when we feel like that, I feel like sometimes the enemy uses that clever little trick of, man, if you just had this, you would be functioning on every cylinder. You ever feel like in life, like you're, you're just missing that one, like, I wouldn't say apple, um, but that one, like, cylinder is not kicked on? Anybody ever feel like that? I do. And it's in those kind of moments where you just feel maybe a little weak or maybe just a little off or something. I think it's in those moments where voices show up and they persuade you, right? Because sometimes in life when all the stuff you're trying doesn't seem to be working, it's easy when a salesman shows up with a magical pill that will give you the rest, right? And we live in the world where we want a pill to fix it rather than a life to change. Does that make sense this morning? So last week we were talking about products that promise results and the enemy's lie that promised she would be like God if she ate the fruit. And obviously the enemy's version is just a scam. And once you get hooked on that performance, religion and lifestyle, you'll always be having to buy the next product, trying to chase that thing that you can never seem to apprehend, which is some mysterious lie that you're missing something. And here's what truth says. Truth says that if, if Jesus paid it all and he injected his spirit inside of you, you have everything that you need right now. I'm not talking about like everything's fulfilled. I'm not saying there's not pain in the world. I'm not saying we don't have struggles. I'm just saying that you have everything you need to get through, not just survive, but to conquer this life. Amen? Now, conquer may not look the same for everybody. It might not mean the same thing for everybody, but nevertheless, we can conquer anything because of 
the life of God inside us, right? Amen. So when we feel like we need an additional thing to get there, we have to stop and look and say, where's this voice coming from, right? Because I know for me, sometimes I'm like, I, I, you, you put so much energy, like pursuing God. You pray, you read the word, you have connections, and you can still hit these moments where you just feel like, ugh, right? And it's easy in that moment to think, man, something's just like, I'm, what am I missing, you know? You ever feel just like off a little bit, right? So I'm like on this, this, this kind of health kick again, right? Or, well, let, me, let me clarify. I'm, I'm about to get on this health kick again <laughs> tomorrow. <clears throat> so one thing that I take every day is a supplement that is basically like fruits and vegetables ground up to a little powder, okay? And I pop those bad boys every day because what it does is it just gives you a little bit of insurance that you're getting the nutrients that your body needs, right? Everybody know that fruits and veggies are good for you, right? God made them, you're supposed to eat them, and you'll be healthy that way, right? Everybody know that, just... Just clarify. Well, I don't know that, so I have to take these pills to help me make sure that I'm getting what I need, right? The problem with these pills, though, is they're not going to make you healthy, okay? I like the pills because they're convenient, they're quick, right? I don't have to, like, eat 12 stalks of celery every day just to get all of that condensed nutrition. I can just pop these two little dudes, right? It's actually four, two veggies, two fruits, and they're great. Love them. Can't taste them, but I I bet they're really good if I open them up. (laughs) I pop these things because I'm like, man, I I know I need this for me. Like, I know I need this as part of just, I mean, come on. This is how God made our bodies to function. I like chicken bites and burgers, and I'm a pizza guy. So, like, the things that I'm just, like, pulled toward eating, unfortunately, aren't the things that are good for me. Um, They're good in moderation, right? They're never probably good for your body, but they're good for my heart. And, (laughs) but I'm prone to, like, junk food eating, right? So we go, like, on vacation. I'm looking for the pizza places. You know, like, you're supposed to be trying all this weird food. I'm like, just give me a pizza. That's why I'm on. I want to try pizza here and there. And I'm so adventurous, right? Like that. But because I'm drawn that way, it's, it's a struggle for me. I have to get on a routine and maintain it before my body adapts, and then I crave the good stuff. Anybody know what I'm talking about? It's, like, really hard at first, but once your body's dependent on it, like, whew, You're good, you know? You start to crave things that are good for you. One important thing, too, is drinking a lot of water. Water is really good for your body. I've heard people say, I used to do construction stuff with guys, and like, I mean, they'd knock down 12 Mountain Dews a day, right? We were talking about this last week, like, it's drywall guys I used to work with, and up in the mountains, they would go in, and they would like sand ceilings all day, these condos we were building and working on, and the drywall crews would come in. They would just sand ceilings like this with no goggles and no mask. So these guys would come out at 5 o'clock looking like just somebody opened up some sweet 16 donuts and dumped them out the door, right? I mean, just head to toe like that thick of powder, and their eyes would open up, right? And you see these little eyeballs in this cool powdery mix of people, and I'm not exaggerating, they would all go crack open the Mountain Dews, right? It's like the construction drink of choice. I like Mountain Dews, right? Water's better for me. Mountain Dew makes me feel horrible, but gosh, it tastes good for some reason, right? That's better for me. It doesn't taste like anything. Mountain Dew's not good for me. I, I still like Mountain Dew, but if I don't drink enough water at this point in my life, I feel it. and I just feel like sick, right? But one guy argued with me one day was, Mountain Dew's made out of water. (laughs) Therefore, they're drinking plenty of water every day. 
And isn't that like the enemy, to twist something that is good, but polluted by other stuff, and make you think that it's okay, right? How many guys know that certain things in your life produce certain results? And there's no pill that will ever substitute a lifestyle that makes you healthy, okay? So Galatians chapter one, or five, verse one. One of my favorite Bibles or books in the Bible. And I just, I love the, I don't know in what tone Paul was writing or having conversations, but you can kind of see through some of these that there were probably tones of frustration and like, you know, burden and almost annoyance sometimes in these. Always, he was always good at like sandwiching it with some encouragement and like perspective about the gospel and what Jesus did. But there's always these little moments of like, good gosh, what is wrong with you, right? The Bible says in Galatians 5.1, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Amen. It is for freedom, right? It's for freedom that he set you free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery, right? Thought. If you're set free, why would you want to go back into the bondage that you were set free from, okay? And this is the relationship that I have with Oreos. I can get off of them, but I always go back, right? God's working on me. He's working on my heart. Verse two, mark my words, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. That's powerful. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace, for through the Spirit we eagerly await by faith, the righteousness for which we hope. That's powerful. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. This is powerful because the context is you have a church culture who's in transition. You have a church culture who's starting to move into different areas and there's different demographics and cultures that are taking place, but there's one thread that is Jesus. There's one thread that's the gospel. This is a guy who's trying to father and be a thread through all kinds of different churches. So he's going to one church you see in the New Testament and he's talking to him about one thing and then he goes to another church and like the emphasis may be on a totally different topic and they're trying to figure out how in the world do we do this? Like, We know deep inside because there's some revelation, there's some layer that was opened up of the anointing of God. Like, I believe that this happened, you know? Like, I believe Jesus was who he says he was. I believe that he got back up from the grave. I believe that he ascended to the Father. I believe that he's inside me. I believe that he paid it all. I believe that I'm justified. Even though I don't look righteous every day, I eagerly await by faith the righteousness that is credited my account because of what he did. There's something in me that knows truth, yeah? These are people who had that conviction, but then they had the struggle of it not always looking like that. And so when it didn't look like that, they would look for the additive, or they would look for the product, or they look for that pill that would take them that extra distance, right? And they got clever because they would pick certain parts of the law, right? Like we do in church still. And they thought, man, well, we, we're just going to be circumcised. You know, we're like, this is the thing, like, I know, like, Jesus paid it all, but this is part of that. 
And Paul steps in almost a little bit frustrated. He's like, guys, you don't understand. He set you free so that you would be free. If you start trying to earn it and get justification and figure out your righteousness by doing stuff again, then you're literally alienating yourself from the grace that came from Calvary and going back under, under an antiquated system that will never produce life in you, but always leave you chasing the next rule in order for you to get enough dopamine that you feel good. It was Instagram before Instagram, right? It was that one little thing that you look at and you're like, man, that is awesome. Somebody liked my stuff. But then nobody liked your next one. You're like, what is wrong? Are they mad at me? Do they not like that post? You know? But this is how we relate to God sometimes because we're like, man, I just feel the presence of God. And then it's like this next week, maybe it's not quite as easy and it's just kind of hard. I feel like the enemy's attacking me or I'm just like, I did something. Is he mad at me? Like he didn't, he didn't give me like a couple smiley faces and click the heart button. I didn't, you know? And then the next week, you know, you feel like God likes you again, Right? You're like, oh, this is great. I'm walking on air. Like, life is easy. Let's just slay every giant, right? This is, the, this is the church culture they were in. So in this place where, like, we don't know how to do freedom is really what it boils down to. We're free, but what in the world does that mean, you know? Like, well, we're free, so we don't have to, like, uh, you know, have a poster of the Ten Commandments up and, like, stare at them every day and try not to do all of that. So, like, okay, I get what you're saying. I understand the concept, but I walk over here. I, what, what, what is freedom? You know, you know, the crazy hardest part about the children of Israel when they exited out of literally generational slavery right? They came from, that's all they knew. They didn't know anything else. You only know what you know because of the experience that you've had, right? And so all of a sudden, this pioneering thing comes up on uh, Moses' life, this call of the Lord to lead them out, and they go on this massive exodus out of generations of slavery. And they get out there, and everybody's like celebrating, like, yeah, let's go take the money and run. We like this is amazing. We're gonna build our own life. There's a land flowing with milk and honey. There's this promise. How do you, they didn't even know what that meant, but it felt right. You know, it was enough to get them moving, right? And sometimes God just gives you enough to get you moving because He wants people to walk by faith, not by understanding. And so he doesn't give you every piece of the puzzle because God's looking for people who follow, not people who constantly have to know every detail of are we there yet, God? Because he knows that if you follow based on what you understand, then disappointment will always be your biggest adversity because every time it doesn't work out the way you thought you understood it, you'll always want to turn back. So they get out in the middle of it and their struggle wasn't that God wasn't there. It wasn't that God wasn't good. God never even almost left the situation. There was miracles almost every day. And you would think after the first couple miracles, a culture would set in of, okay, we're good. Like, okay, he's, he opened up the water and drowned everybody that was after us. And then they get Michael Jackson on the other side of the lake, celebrate for a little bit. A couple weeks go by. Their dopamine levels are down. And they're like, oh, this is terrible. You know what their struggle, greatest struggle, I think, was? They came out of slavery that they had always known. They knew how to do it, right? But freedom, even the guy leading them, the mediator, Moses, no one knew how to do freedom yet. They didn't have anything to look at. They didn't have anything to observe. They didn't have a poster on the wall. They didn't have commandments to say, okay, do this, don't do this. They had to rely on hearing from God. Wow, what an inconvenient thing. And because they knew slavery but didn't know freedom, they end up working themselves into this covenant where God would have to write it down. 
Moses would have to show it to them, and they'd say, yeah, now this is what we're talking about. Let's do that. I like that. That's a great plan. Let's, let's do that plan. And then they just fail miserably, right? Jesus shows up, and for the first time in all of existence, save maybe the pre-fall moment of Genesis, for the first time someone shows up in freedom as a model for us, as someone to look at their life and see how it can function, to look at their forgiveness and see how that can function, to look at their peace and see how that can function, you know? For the first time, Jesus shows up and he's walking among them and it's very intimate, it's very close, it's also very blunt sometimes. And they didn't understand it, but they were pulled to it, right? Jesus walks with them, has this just awesome ability to communicate and show his heart and reveal the heart of God. And he starts challenging their paradigm and say, you know, we, we've always understood it like this and we've taught it this way. And it's not that God's end of the bargain is off. It's just that the enemy always messes with the way you think you heard it. And so you start following one direction that was really maybe never God's intention of the thing that even he might have created. And sometimes it's not that we're far away from God's stuff. Sometimes we're further away from God when we're using his stuff. Yeah? See, these guys were in a place post-context of the cross, right? Post-cross moment. And they believe the gospel because something in them says, this is true, this, I, I don't get it, but it's there. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You have that like Holy Spirit moment, you read the word or you have a conversation or you're just like meditating with the Lord or praying with God and like something hits you and it's like, I don't get this, but I just believe it, you know? This is where they are, but they don't know how to do freedom, right? So they wanna go back to what they've always known. I said, man, yeah, Jesus paid it all. Now let's start implementing some of these outlines. In other words, I don't quite feel totally you know, free today. So what products are there that will help me get the rest of the way? You know? Jesus paid it all, that's awesome. I should be celebrating every single day, righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit, like all these cool fruits of the Spirit. Like, okay, but if that's not, if it's not working yet, let me put it that way, because sometimes we feel like it's true, but it's not, why isn't it working? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Like, why, why isn't it working? I prayed, I had faith, I stood on it. I mean, I did all the things I know to do, but it doesn't seem to be working, right? And the truth is, sometimes it's just not working the way that you perceive it should. And that's when you have to learn the other parts, which is faith and trust. Because sometimes when it's not working, you don't need the answer, you just need God. Amen? Sometimes I don't need it to work out the way I think I need it to work out. I just need to go back to that place where he's enough, even if it didn't work out. Amen? That I don't have to have the answer in order to qualify what I think I believe about my theology. I just have to have Jesus who has all the answers, and I can be just dumb sometimes and be okay with that, you know? One of the best things we can be is dumb. Amen? It's a, it's a great place. I'm not saying, like, don't contend. I'm just saying you're not gonna figure it all out so don't let your heart get so troubled in performance mode. Because once you start getting the answers, you have to get the rest of them, and you'll never win that battle, right? So when they're in this place, like Jesus paid it all, we're free, and they start going to back to trying to feel like they're free. Paul jumps in, he's like, you don't get it. The second you go into that mindset of performance and circumcision is the second you start to separate yourself from the fact that Jesus really paid it all. You're alienating yourself from the grace of God because you're going back into performance mode. He's frustrated, right? He's like annoyed. And I think he's frustrated because he's walked this out himself and probably is in the middle of that. 
You see it echoed in Romans where it's like, I'm doing the thing I don't want to do and the thing I don't want to do, I can't stop doing. But there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. He gets it, right? He's like, no, Jesus really paid it all. Even on the days I'm misfiring, God is still enough. And I refuse to settle for a bottle of little vitamins, of spirit vitamins that will take me the rest of the way just because I feel like I'm not already seated with him in heavenly places. And see, the enemy, I think, sometimes look, looks for those moments and he shows up and he tries to advertise that feeling, that rest of the way. He tries to show up and say, you know what? It's, God is good all the time. He says, but here's what you're feeling today. Tell you what, if you eat this fruit, it will give you the thing that you're missing. Right? That was, that was her, her, her moment. That was her moment to either stand firm on the fact that truth is bigger than her feeling or believe the lie that was being sold to her. Sometimes our greatest struggle is the feeling, not the lack of truth. You yeah? know? Why do you think the Bible tells you to stand? When you've done everything, the Bible says, stand. And when you've stood, stand. In other words, he's talking to people, probably because of his own experience, who have stood and they didn't keep standing, they tried something else. Rather than stand firm and see the salvation of God, they tried to move and figure out a different way, right? There's wisdom in what he's doing. Let's read on. Now, let me say this, and just really quick, I'm definitely not a health guru, so don't take my word for it. Take his. Wouldn't that be awesome right now if like some celebrity came out and was like, <laughs> I had hired him to give you a health, never mind. Just imagining life without limits. Let me put it this way because I've been told this several times, and I'm still praying about it. But I've been told that it doesn't matter what exercise routine you get onto if you don't have a diet to back it up. Amen. Now, I'm still trying. I don't know about that. You know, I'm kind of like, I don't know. We'll see. I'm going to try it all. I'm going to try Bad diet and exercise and just see if it works, you know. The truth is it doesn't. I can't eat pizza and Mountain Dew all the time and just go to the gym and expect to like them to cancel each other out. Because even if you go to the gym and still eat like that, I just still feel horrible. Anybody know what I'm talking about? One thing doesn't substitute all the other stuff that's off, Right? You can't do one thing and it fix the feelings of another thing, okay? I can exercise and that's good, but if I don't have the diet to back it up, right? And it's tricky here because it's easy, and this is where I say the enemy's so clever, because he'll take the areas that we were called to steward and he'll blur it just enough that it becomes performance stewardship rather than real stewardship. Because it's true, like scripturally, all throughout the Testaments that we read, there's areas where there's instruction, there's areas where there's uh, direction, there's areas that say, yeah, do this, don't do this. Even in the New Testament, there's plenty of areas that say, hey, this is good for your life, and this is not. And it could seem like God's trying to get you to perform for a quality of life. But it's not performance when it was the thing that was given to you before the enemy messed it up to steward. See, somewhere deep in all the like stuff that we, we face, there's the real you, okay? And the real you doesn't like feeling like this every day. The real you doesn't want to be walking through life with no energy, right? Everybody know? Everybody good? The real you doesn't want to get out of bed dreading what 
lies ahead of them. That's why it bothers us, right? Anybody ever just get so, uh, like, just done with being just, like, yeah. apathetic? Yeah. Just like, uh, And then we, like, try to tell people about Jesus. God's good. <laughs> right? That's how, we, that's how we roll. We fall asleep in our faith in the middle of the week sometimes. Right? He's like, man, God's good. Yeah, church was good. Man, it was great. Let me put it this way, and I'm not like trying to get you in a performance culture at all, and hopefully I'll qualify that in a second. Just going to church on a Sunday isn't, that, uh, that's, that's not enough to fix the rest of the week's diet. Amen? Yeah? And so what we, what we see is we see people who maybe like they, they're, they're just looking for relationship. Maybe they're needing certain things in their life. Maybe they don't feel strong enough. Maybe they're dealing with uh, uh, emotional challenge. Maybe they're dealing with financial struggle. Maybe they're dealing with things that if they just had somebody else in their life intersecting their path and doing this thing together, it would totally change what the rest of the week looks like, right? We live in the day, again, where people go to a church or they go to a seminar and they think it's going to be the one that changes, that just takes me the extra step of the way. And the truth is, those things and these things can be so beneficial for your life, they absolutely can be. Those two little pills, four little pills, that I take every single day are great for me, but they're not everything that I need. And they're not a substitution for what I'm supposed to be eating. It doesn't mean because I take this one thing that I can eat horrible all day long. It doesn't work like that. It doesn't, I mean, it literally is pointless that way, right? And people try those pills but don't change the diet and they think, man, why is it not working? <laughs> it's supposed to walk on water by now. Is this, are you dealing with this too, you know? And we get like so just neutral, right? And then hope deferred makes the heart sick and we got our hopes up. We're like, man, God's changing the world and didn't go like we thought. And we're like, God, we love you. Where are you? Move in our cities, move in our nation. And I don't know that the lack of what we perceive to be the movement of God in our nation is the issue as much as it is the lack of movement in us. I don't know that it's really like God's just waiting for us to get loud enough. I don't believe that at all. I just, I believe God's waiting for us to be postured, right? In other words, let me say it like this. I don't want to be unactive in my faith, crying out to God to move from my couch, and I'm not talking about just the physical. I'm talking like a mentality of just sitting there, like, God, you do it all, you know? I want to be willing to do what I can do and let God be the area that I can't be. And I know I say this all the time, but I, I, I don't want to live a life crying out for God to do the impossible when I'm too lazy to do my possible, you yeah? But your possible is hard sometimes. Amen. I'll read a couple things and I'll start to wind down here. Verse number seven. I think here again is the trickery that shows up. And this wasn't the devil himself. This was even people in the church who were trying to figure it out and they just didn't know really what to do, probably. But verse seven says, You were running a good race. In other words, you started, you got like the revelation of the cross, you're like moving in the right direction. Then he says, who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? Who cut it? Like who, like, like you were in the right direction and all of a sudden you saw that billboard and you went this way. And you're like, oh, wait a minute, shortcut, right? That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. That kind of persuasion, right? What did the enemy do in Genesis? He persuaded her. He advertised something. He had to sell her first that she was missing something. 
and then he sold her the solution. Genius salesman, right? These guys are in this place where they've got it all now. I'm not saying everything's fulfilled. I'm not saying like heaven's come to earth and earth's gone to heaven and everything's like functioning. There's still brokenness. There's still chaos. There's still murder. There's all these things going on. But the truth is they've got the spirit of Christ that raised him from the dead inside of them. The one that they either saw or heard about and the one that could heal the sick. And I mean, like this isn't like a, a little bit of substance. This is like there's a complete truth that's taking place here but it doesn't always seem like it. And when it doesn't always seem like it, that's when we want to find some other way to try to like get that rest, you know, like get that little bit more. Skip down to verse 13. It says, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, free. But do not use your freedom to indulge in the flesh. Rather, serve one another. So here he's qualifying. I don't even know that their biggest issue was sinful issues. Their biggest issue, I think, from reading this book is the fact that they were constantly trying to go back to a system that Jesus had just fulfilled in order to feel like they were on the right track. He says, do not use your freedom to indulge in the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. In other words, if you allow that culture of division to operate, eventually it all comes apart. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. You know what's hard about walking by the Spirit? Is it takes faith that is always magnifying the truth of God over the feeling of our day, of our week, of our emotions, of our situation, of our circumstance. That's what walking by the Spirit is. Walking by the Spirit's being right in the middle of something that seems broken, but saying that God is still God, God's truth is still truth, and whether I feel like it or not, there's still victory because all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord. If I can just either stand or keep on the path that he has for me and not buy one of these billboards of some other way, I will eventually come into the thing or the destiny that God has for my life because God is faithful to fulfill his promise, and there's no pill that can substitute what only God can do. Just don't get off the path, right? Just follow. That's hard. That's life by the Spirit. Life by the flesh isn't always sin. Life by the flesh sometimes is performance religion where you're trying to do it rather than trust that he's done it. You know? Keep reading. It says, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want, but if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. I'm thankful that we're not under the law. Amen. Check out the obvious one. Verse 19, the acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish, amb selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, here's what I want to uh, just point out this morning and, 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 and crush, because we cannot evangelize the world appropriately, nor in the real nature of the Father, if we use this verse as a weapon against people who we perceive don't measure up or have value because they're dysfunctional. Okay? Because what we do sometimes, we take this, and the enemy's the one who persuades us to approach it this way because he wants us to think that God just tolerates us rather than loves us. But we take this sometimes and we look at people who are in the middle of this kind of struggle and we use it as a separation tool. 
And then we try to sell people on, hey, and it is true. Here's the truth. We've got something that the world needs. Amen. I'm, I'm fully on board with that. The world needs Jesus. That's what everybody's groaning for. All creation groans, waiting on the manifestation of sons of God. And there's sons and daughters of God out there right now who are groaning for that revelation of saying, you know what? He loves me. Like there is something bigger than all of this life. There's something bigger than all the understanding of, in the world. There's someone who's behind this entire thing. There's someone who made everything that we see every single day. There's someone who's behind the breeze. There's someone who's behind the sun. There's someone who's right smack in the middle of life. And they're just groaning to come in contact with that, you know? But sometimes as a church, we go out and we use it a way to point the finger. We say, you know what? You're, um, who's it going to be? <sighs> boo-boo. I'm going to pick on you, boo-boo. You are full of selfish ambition. And you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, check out some of these. Jealousy. Anybody ever been jealous as a believer? Not me. <laughs> Idolatry, hatred, discord, fits of rage. Hmm. Impurity. Dissensions, factions. I know a lot of people like that in the body of Christ, right? Does that mean that they're not going to heaven? Nope. That's not what it says. It says, I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. I don't think he's just talking about eternal principle. He's talking about the fact that the life of the kingdom of God will not show up and be the benefit for those who are walking according to that pattern. In other words, if my life is full of bitterness, hatred, rage, jealousy, the functionality of the kingdom of God will not be the thing that is showing up every day in my life when I operate on that diet. doesn't mean I can't go to heaven. It just means heaven's not coming to me. It just means that I'm trading victory for pain, right? But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Everybody say, easy peasy. Easy peasy. You know why this stuff is here? Because he's telling you what diet works. And he knows that inside all of us there's a groan for peace, for victory. There's a groan for righteousness. There's a groan for holiness. And he's giving you the diet. He's not just giving you commandments. He's saying, hey, if you will meditate on this, if you'll eat this, if you'll spend time with me, if you'll get in the word, if you'll spend time in community with other people, if you'll, if you'll do things that are helping you in life, that one pill thing that promise you, promises that like results that get you all the way is a lie. It's just a lie. Nothing will ever substitute a healthy diet. Yeah, right. Amen? Yeah. I refuse to live a life of trying to buy those products. Those moments where in my faith I might feel weak and I feel like if I tried this one method it would fix it, you know? You, you know the greatest method there is? Go to Jesus. Go to, why, why settle for a method when you have God literally sitting there waiting for you to just come run and say, God, I'm just like, whoo. It's not feeling it today, but I trust you, you know? Don't let disappointment get you off track. Don't let the enemy's advertising get you off track. Yeah? 
That's a struggle. Don't go back to things that Jesus set you free from because you don't know what freedom's supposed to look like yet, you know? Mm. 